first say, um, I'm Kale, welcome to the Kale Scale, and today I'm talking about Hotel Transylvania 3 Summer Vacation. <laughs> oh, wait, where's that now? Right now? Yes. Yeah. Go. No, one second. Hello, I'm Kale. I'm Kale. I'm Kale. I'm Kale. This is Kale. I'm Kale. This is 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 the Kale scale. This is Kale. This is Kale. This is Kale. This is Kale. Welcome to the Kale scale. This episode, the much anticipated Mac and Me 2. This movie has Eric Cruz returning with Mac. Unfortunately, they just used the same puppet again. Uh, they didn't try to refurnish it either. It's it's pretty bad looking. It, it looks but, exactly like it's been in, in a warehouse for 10 years. That would, like, it was right underneath the spot where it was leaking anytime there was a storm. But as I said, the budget was really cheap on this one. I think they only went as high as maybe a thousand dollars. But you know, I, I think I can speak for everyone saying that we were waiting for a sequel. We were. And it took them 10 years. In 1998, they finally made it. 20 year anniversary, whoop whoop. <laughs> so the basic plot of this movie is that Eric Cruz and Mac, as in Big Mac, go and try to release every alien kept in Area 51 because after gaining his newly American status from the last movie, Mac feels that every other alien deserves that right too. It's a, it's a very ham-fisted uh, political metaphor there. It is. Uh, but they did get Donald Trump to cameo on this, so you know, that was nice. They did. He gave yes. Mac directions in a hotel. Exactly. This was his greatest cameo since the Little Rascals. And I thought the decision to have Nicolas Cage voice Mac in this one was interesting. Very interesting. I thought it was for the better, though. Probably. It gave a comedic effect to the movie. Mac had just recently learned English in this movie, so uh, Nicolas Cage did his best broken English in this movie. It was quite interesting. Mm -hmm. Sometimes he would just make alien sounds, and then sometimes he would speak English. Also, the decision to kill off Eric's entire family was very interesting. They all died in a car wreck in the first five minutes. And that car wreck, it wasn't even a car wreck. They just, <laughs> they, they walked out into the road like pet cemetery, and then yeah, it, they're, yeah, the grandpa was like, no, and he ran after them and tripped, and then they got hit got by all the of them. Joke. And then, you know, sometimes in this movie they kind of forgot that uh, Eric is in a wheelchair, because in some scenes he is, and some scenes he isn't. Uh, I don't know if that was an artistic choice uh, from the director. I don't know what M. Night Shyamalan was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> it is possible that it was an artistic choice, sort of symbolizing as the aliens are escaping from Area 51, Eric is also escaping from the confines of his, uh, his wheelchair. Yeah, it's real weird that the twist of this movie that is, is that it's a prequel to Unbreakable. <laughs> you know, I didn't expect that. Uh, at the end of the movie, <laughs> Mag just uh, transforms into Bruce Willis. I also wasn't expecting him to still be voiced by Nick Cage at that point. Yeah, but me either. They kept up with it. It was real bad lip syncing. It was really bad. They did it like uh, 40s cartoons. I have a fun fact about this movie. Oh. Uh, it was released on March 10th, which is the 69th day of the year. Oh, nice. <laughs> nice? <laughs> and nice Shyamalan. I also thought it was really brave to have Danny DeVito play the villain. I also wasn't expecting it to tie back in uh, to the accident in the first so, you know, mm -hmm. five, ten minutes of the movie. Yeah. Because I didn't think Danny DeVito could uh, see over the console of those big trucks. Yeah. That was the second twist of the movie. It was. That it was Danny DeVito the whole yeah. time. He was playing a tall person. He was. was, the it, role. was it looked very bad. Yes. He had stilts in this movie. <laughs> he did have stilts. Artistic choice, I might say. Uh, I'm glad that they refilmed the entirety of the McDonald's scene. Uh, that was completely <laughs> necessary. Mm -hmm. uh, they dug up the corpse of the original Ronald McDonald and uh, dressed him up. Uh, a little controversial, but I think it worked out well in the end. Yeah. I did think it was a little weird that you could still see, like, the, the titanium wire that they run through his arms. They didn't, they just decided not to edit that out. Uh, that was kind of strange. Or they forgot. This movie was very lazy at some points. Alternatively, and this is just, you know, a little conspiracy theory for you, this was also an artistic choice showing how people are actually puppets. Yes. Mm -hmm. And this, uh, the government controls us. It's true. Yeah. 
fight the power. I uh, like the Jennifer Aniston. Uh, she's the one that choreographed uh, this new McDonald's yeah. dance. And this technically is in the Friends universe. Exactly. Because at that point in time, she was filming season whatever of Friends, yes. and then she mm -hmm. had to. Uh, she didn't have much time to film this scene in between shooting Friends, and so she was in her exact same uh, Friends outfit. It was weird uh, to or leave in her recorded mental breakdown on the set of the movie. Mm -hmm. It did help the movie though, I might say. Gilbert Godfrey voicing all the aliens. Kind of a weird choice, but uh, I think it worked out in the end. Mm -hmm. uh, he brings life to all of the 22 aliens in this movie. And the fact that Big Mac Sauce is the secret to immortality yes. was the third twist of the movie. Yes. They actually killed Danny DeVito three times in the movie, exactly. and every time he just kept coming back. Now, uh, I think that was a little bit of method acting from Danny DeVito, because uh, as you know, he is immortal. Mm -hmm. But uh, it really helped the plot, I think. And it was real weird that in one of, one of the times Danny DeVito died, it was because, uh, now this is really weird because this is a PG movie, it was really weird that he died to auto <laughs> It was, but you know, I think Gil Black Chamla knows what's good for the kids. Yeah. They need uh, to learn about that at some point. Exactly. And you know, Danny DeVito is the perfect person to pull this off. <laughs> and, the dedication in that scene was perfect. Yeah. Uh, Truly Oscar worthy, I, I would say. Unfortunately, it did not win an Oscar. It won several. Several Oscars. Yes. Uh, it actually won Best Special Effects. Yes. Uh, there was some really good wire work. They, For they, Ronald McDonald. Yes. <laughs> and as Andrew said, they did leave it in, which I think only enhanced it. Overall, I think it gets a 10 out of 10. And that after credit scene uh, of Thanos was definitely worth it. I can't wait to see Mac fight him in the sequel. <laughs> <laughs> that was horrible, but you know, that's what you get for improv. I love it. Hello, this is Kale, and welcome to the Kale Scale. This episode, Hurricane Heist. Now, I left it up to Andrew, Colin, and Joe to pick a movie, and uh, Joe said something stupid, and so Colin was the one who gave me Hurricane Heist. I kind of wish that I had what Joe had had, because somehow that would have been more tolerable. <laughs> what did Joe say again? He was going to edit all three of the Hobbit movies oh, right. into one big supercut that was also just the movie. <laughs> Hurricane Heist is barely a movie. I, I can't even, it's hard to say it's even, it even classifies as a movie. The first few minutes of this movie are just kids with really bad accents, bad country accents, just saying, you're stupid, no, you're stupid, and punching each other. And then, the since there's a hurricane, because hurricane heist, their dad just shoves them in a random house, and he's like, I gotta get our truck back on the road, even though he didn't need to get their truck back on the road. What? <laughs> and so then he's trying to pull his truck out of a ditch, and you think, oh, in a hurricane, maybe he'll get swept away, a la Pa Kent Man of Steel style. <laughs> or maybe he'll just, like, drown. No, a water tower falls on him. Oh. Just falls on him, squishes him. And one of the kids is like, if he dies, that's going to be your fault. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Because that kid just has problems, I guess. And this never comes back into the movie later, like at any point. That's rough. And then one of the kids sees a skull face in the storm. Okay. Like just a skull and it like reaches out and yells at him. <laughs> that also never comes back into the film at all. What? He just sees it and just gets scared. Like, they, later they just say that he's scared of storms, but that same kid becomes a storm chaser. He's both interested and afraid of storms. That doesn't make any sense. So the main plot about this movie is some random uh, Scottish FBI agent who doesn't speak with an accent, <laughs> because it's too expensive to get people with accents, is betraying his other partner, who apparently killed somebody or let somebody die, and that's why she's working at this facility that just shreds money. And he has this whole intricate scheme where he got some hackers, some extra muscle, the entirety of the police department, all on his side so they could steal all this non-shredded money while a hurricane is going on. 
Now, the entire plan hinged on there being a big enough hurricane, or the hurricane lasting long enough. They only got lucky that it was as big as it was. This film also tries to make the, the weather, like, weather agencies look cool. Like, I know they do a, a, a good job, but the way they present it in this film, they're like, they make it seem like they're the FBI or something. <laughs> like, they have a mission control, and they, they're, like, sending agents out. Like, no, you just, you see the weather. You're all meteorologists. I can tune in on the weather channel and see this. The acting isn't much better, and oh my god, the dialogue in this movie <laughs> is something else. It's not even real dialogue, it's like they just had a computer program just spit out lines. <laughs> like, the FBI agent and the weather guy are in his storm truck, which they are really proud they got that on set, because they're like, they keep saying, it's built like a tank, it's built like a tank, it's so awesome. And like, ooh, check out all these gadgets it has. And it, they, end, they just end up blowing it up, but that fails too, so it was kind of worthless. <laughs> but anyway, they're in the truck together, and she's shooting at the corrupt cops, because of course this movie has corrupt cops. And she's like, I'm out of ammo. And then he's like, what does that mean? She's like, I shot all my bullets. <laughs> Excuse me? What? And that's that's just like the tip of the iceberg. Oh man, that's the tip of the tornado. The, Gross. the dialogue from there doesn't get much better. I kind of tried to block it out because it was just <laughs> so bad. The criminals are just kind of random. Like none of them have a personality or anything. The villain also dies in a really stupid over the top way. They're going into the eye of the storm, so they won't be seen or caught, even though the town is evacuated, so no one would see them. And the villain dies because his truck breaks down, and then the... He's driving an 18-wheeler, and the bed part of the truck, which is carrying all the money, flips over and hits his the main truck part, and it explodes. <laughs> like, the tornado just carries it up, and it lands. There goes the villain. They force a really bad romance between the storm chaser guy oh and God. the FBI agent girl. The, which they never say if she killed someone, like killed her partner. We just know that she's at this facility because she did something. But she never clarifies. They team up to go get his brother because for some reason his brother is the only guy who knows how to fix the generator for the processing plant where they shred the money. He's the only guy in town who does this. And for some reason, he stayed in the hurricane. And they only really bring up that whole you let dad die part up once, and they, it doesn't really go anywhere. He's like, okay, see you in the next five years, because I guess they don't get together all that much. But by the end of the movie, it's like they've, that never happened. And the whole being afraid of storm things never comes back either. <laughs> the acting isn't much better. Like, the two hacker people, they're a couple, they're pretty bad. Like, there's this part where the main hacker guy gets shot by the other brother in his 18-wheeler that's carrying the money, and he's just, ah, 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 in the back of the truck. And the brother's like, oh, shut up, it doesn't hurt that much. While his hacker wife is, like, freaking out in the back. They die, too. They just leave them in the truck. Like, they rescue the brother, and then just... They die. What? And then the FBI agent lady at the end was like, hey, we got $200 million here and it's the three of us. We should go to Mexico. And then like they're all like, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. And then she's like, I was just kidding and like playfully punches them. But like that's not something you joke about after you just all nearly died. Plus, she's also probably going to get arrested or fired from her job since she's still lost. <laughs> What is happening? Hello. Hello. This was actually my favorite part of Hurricane Heist. Yes. It's the highlight of my career. <laughs> I can't wait till that goes up on his IMDb. This movie should not exist, but somehow does. This is a negative 10 out of 10. This is what all bad but enjoyably bad movies should strive to be. This beat out Venom in that spot. This is the new movie that I'll compare to when something is just that bad. Hello?
I'm Kale, and welcome to the Kale Scale. This episode, Hotel Transylvania 3. Summer Vacation. Summer Vacation. Really glad that they didn't make a monster pun out of that, like Scarecation or Monstercation. They just kept it simple. Also, me and Joe are here. Yeah. Say hi. Say hi. Hi! And get up in front of the camera and do it. Uh, that's probably, that's like all my face. To start off, I guess I'll start with the cast. The cast was really good. This is the only thing that Adam Sandler has been good in in a very long time. He's just good. He's a good father character, uh, though if he had kids in real life, I'm pretty sure he would be a terrible father. He, he might have kids in real life, I don't know. I'll look it up. Uh, I don't think anyone would have kids with Adam Sandler. I don't care for Jim Gaffigan normally, he's just not my kind of comedian, but he did good as one of the maybe the weirdest animated villains I've seen. He's Van Helsing, but he's been alive for like more than a hundred years. Uh, so he's like in this weird robot body, but it's only his arms and head that survive. Uh, and he has like maybe a liver in a jar, and it's on wheels, and he doesn't actually get legs. He does have a kid, Sadie Madison Sandler, and his wife is Jackie Sandler. <sighs> you know, the weird thing about this movie is that a lot of people you wouldn't normally like in a movie, or at least I wouldn't, are good in this. Maybe because you don't see their faces. Like Kevin... James is good in this as Frankenstein. Steve Buscemi, God bless his soul, uh, he's a good werewolf. Though they never show him as human, which I find kind of weird. I don't think I've ever seen him as human. Though if they ever do show him as human, I would hope that they show him as just Steve Buscemi. Selena Gomez does well as Mavis? Mavis? Mavis. I forget how to say her name. Mavis. Mavis. They don't give her a lot of lines, obviously. But she and Adam Sandler actually work kind of well off each other. Jesse, no, not Jesse, Adam. Andy Sandberg. Andy Sandberg. Yeah, my boy. He was, I just love him. He's just a normal guy, and he literally does not care that he's surrounded by monsters. He's just rolling with it. He's the dumbest guy in the world. He is, both in real life and in whatever movie he's in. Uh, the, the child actors aren't that bad, though they don't give them a lot of lines either. Yeah. You have their son, whatever actor that is, and there's also a wolf pup that's with them. Van Helsing's daughter, Erica Van Helsing. Voiced by somebody. She's good. The main plot of the movie is Drac trying to move on from his dead wife, and he meets Erica on a cruise ship that his daughter takes him to. Um, then they start to fall in love. But Erica also has to fulfill her familiar responsibilities of being a Van Helsing by trying to kill Dracula and all the other monsters. This movie just has a lot of good lessons, like not doing what your family does just because you have an obligation. Because sometimes I've just what your family that, does... like, in my life. Joe, this is the Kale scale. Not the Joe scale. Well, I mean, we're here too. This is my thoughts. How are we supposed to comment on this? You can't interrupt him though, Joe, that's rude. It was just a comment! He just doesn't like the movie, so ignore everything that he says. Yeah, Joe hated this movie. I did not hate it. Yes, you did. The lesson is that you don't have to follow everything that your family does. Because maybe that's just not good for you in the long run. Uh... <coughs> the biggest lesson... Kale, uh, Colin, don't interrupt him. And it also had good lessons for kids. Like, if your parent does find someone else, whether it being a divorce or a death of a spouse, that they can find someone else. And that you can be a family again. Which is a good lesson that not a lot of kids' movies do. Normally it's just the typical, you know, standard family, but this one changes it up a bit. I especially like the, you don't have to follow your family's legacy. You're free to do whatever you want. Colin, are you okay? I'm good. Oh, I forgot the most important member of the cast, Blobby, voiced by the director, Gendy Tardiofsky. The animation is really good. Everything is so fluid and well designed. It's very distinct in its animation. And it's weirdly exaggerated all the time. Yeah, it is. It's like a cartoon, pretty much. Like a 2D cartoon. Which, you know, from the director makes sense. He's worked on things like Dexter's Laboratory, which is very fluid. All the monsters are uniquely designed. Every time you see one, it's something different. Everyone just feels different, and it's just a unique design. Now, you don't get much in the way of, like, actual comedy. There is some, but more of it's, like, visual gags. Like, one of my favorites is that Atlantis is just Las Vegas. Like, they started off by saying Las Vegas, or uh, Atlantis, has a uh, culture and history more dignified than Greece. And then Atlantis is just Las Vegas. They go to the Bermuda Triangle, which does trap ships, but they're not spread out or anything. They're just trapped up and up and up. Where'd all the humans go? 
they're dead. I think the climax of this movie is my favorite. Because Van Helsing wants his daughter to get an ancient artifact that would help him destroy all monsters, so his plan is to have a dance party, invite all the monsters, and then kill them with this. And the thing he had his daughter get is a scroll that summons a kraken, voiced by Joe Jonas. It's the best thing ever, because the kraken is just destroying everybody and just wrecking the place, and the only way they can try to fight it is by good music. Andy Samberg gets out his DJ kit, because, you know, once a bar mitzvah DJ, always a bar mitzvah DJ. And he plays some good music to counteract the bad music. And the choices of music are really good. First they go with Good Vibrations, which is a good song, The Beach Boys. Then they go Don't Worry, Be Happy, also a good song. Uh, and then the final song they use to save the day is the Macarena. Just the, I think they describe it as the most brain-numbing happy song you can find. Speaking of the music, the soundtrack is really good. I'm pretty sure Good Vibrations was in the Emoji movie, so it's no, not it good. And overall, I would give this movie an 8 out of 10. Just for the good lessons, the great animation, the good story, and just the soundtrack is also good. I'd suggest you go and listen to the evil music because uh, it's actually catchy and I like it. And just overall, it's a good movie. I wouldn't say I'd want another Hotel Transylvania, though if they decided to make another one, it'd be good. I'd say this is my favorite Hotel Transylvania movie. And they're willing to do what it takes no matter what. <laughs> Make bloopers. Yes. Van Helsa. Don't stop it. No. I can edit it. Erica also has to fulfill her familiar responsibilities. The abilities. The abilities. The abilities. <laughs> it's not that hard to say. Just I know. Not, don't. Don't. Stop it. It also had good lessons for kids. Like, if your parent dies, uh, no, post. don't Jesus. stop it, don't stop it. Christ almighty man. Whether it being a divorce or a death of a spouse, they can, uh... What? Oh my god. No, that does, doesn't make sense. What? The way you said it. Colin, are you okay? I'm good. Oh, I forgot to, uh, crap. Did you got we got so far. <laughs> they go to the Bermuda, nope, nope. <laughs> Don't, uh, not even uh, close. Kale. This is a lot. I feel like it's just a lot of me looking straight down. No problem. It's fine. Trying to remember my lines. As long as you look. Reboots aren't perfect, that's the best. Yeah, that's why I don't really care. 